over to you, Craig. I think anybody who's got an interest in collecting vintage Star Wars will have come across looking at some point, and whether that's just been one of their eye-catching covers or an ad or maybe the letter set promotion that's a real crossover piece from 1978 that's a magazine i've had in my collection for a long time and it sort of started me on a bit of a journey to explore lookings a bit more and like all my collecting journeys these days it has ended up in a massive blog so yeah we've got part one and part two of a blog at generationskywalker.com and it's entitled these are the mags you're looking for so i think it's worth just doing a little bit of background for anybody who's perhaps overseas or indeed anybody that's under 45 because i think there's some specifics about this magazine that we probably need to get into for people to have an appreciation of it so back in 1977 78 the uk had three television channels bbc one bbc two and itv and if you wanted to know what was going to be coming up on the bbc you would have to go and buy a weekly magazine called the radio times and if you wanted to go and see what was coming up on itv you would have to go buy a magazine called the tv times and these channels were funded very differently the bbc was publicly funded through tv license whereas ITV was uh, financed through advertising. And because of that, they had slightly different flavours. So in really broad terms, the BBC would put out things that were slightly more worthy than their commercially funded uh, rivals. So as a kid, BBC would give you very middle class Blue Peter, whereas ITV would give you the slightly hipper Magpie. And on Saturday mornings where you got Swap Shop, on uh, on the BBC, you got the anarchy of Tiswas. So these things were very differently flavoured, and that was reflected in these listings magazines. So the Radio Times, you know, I remember my grandparents getting the Radio Times, and it had a very broadsheet Sunday supplement feel to it, whereas the TV Times was a lot more sort of populist and bright and in your face. And what the TV Times had as an offshoot was a sister magazine, which they dubbed the Junior TV Times, and that was Looking. So what Looking got to do above magazines of that day and age, which were, you know, you could get pinups from your favourite pop stars, film stars, sports stars. You know, everybody did that. But what Looking did is it had access to some very specific properties. So it was able to produce comic strips of popular ITV shows at the time, which is something you couldn't get anywhere else. And the other thing that really made it stand out was it had these beautiful, beautiful painted covers that were probably, I mean, I'd say these covers were, were sort of among some of the most amazing bits of art of the era. The art director team at Lookin contacted a chap called Analdo Putsu, who was an Italian artist who worked in London. Now, this guy had made his name through the, the 50s, 60s and 70s, creating uh, movie posters. So he would create posters for like Hammer films and the famous Get Carter poster of uh, Michael Caine and the shirt he's wearing is all kind of psychedelic. That was one of his pieces. So they were commissioning this movie poster guy to paint these covers that gave it this real quality and unique character above anything else that was going on. So, you know, you can imagine all the other magazines have got photographic covers. Looking has got these images that are so full of life and colour. And as it turned out, some really quirky juxtaposition of characters. I mean, Mark, I know you're a fan of this guy's work. In the days before Photoshop, obviously, what always used to really stand out to me was eye for composition. So back then, you know, to paint a picture is what is one thing, but to incorporate several several different unconnected objects or faces or you know whatever was was an art form in itself. I mean, he he was a really talented guy, and clearly, um, I'm, I can only guess that being a film poster artist to begin with really stood him in good stead for creating these things because that's what a film put you have to convey a film in either one very very powerful image or you know a, a culmination of several different elements coming together and interacting in a way that emulates the style of film that you're uh, about to go and see so 
his talent as a, a painter, but also as a as a designer and um, a graphic artist, clearly on another level. Yeah. And I think they were lucky to have him. I mean, he was there. He was working in Soho, I think, around the corner from where this magazine was being put together. It's almost like you feel like he was slumming it for a kid's magazine. But it's resulted in a whole body of work because this was a weekly magazine. So there are hundreds and hundreds of these amazing images. Um, But looking specifically at, at Star Wars, I mean, ITV was quite a rich network. You know, it had all this cash from, you know, tobacco, alcohol big brand car manufacturers so it had all this money and it was very good at buying all the big glossy shows from the US and bringing them over to the UK so at the time of Star Wars six million dollar man was probably uh, the the best example of that Um, so you would get like a six million dollar man strip inside the comic alongside some slightly more homegrown sci-fi like the Tomorrow People which was a, a more of a, a kind of UK production. So when Star Wars came out in um, the winter of 77 in London, it slotted right into what looking was all about. So as you can imagine, they just latched on to Star Wars as a, as a real element to their magazines going forward over the next few years. All of the, the stars would feature, but also advertisers like Palatoy and Helix took advertising in their spaces. So there are very few issues um, between particularly like the height of 78 into 79, where there isn't an issue with a bit of Star Wars in it somewhere. So what I've tried to do with this blog is catalog it all, is to go through and identify these issues and showcase them. Um, And what I've tried to do is rather than just make it a big chronological list, I've kind of done it in order of, I guess, um, prominence. So the first part of the blog um, looks at when Star Wars got a front cover. Um, so there were a number of issues where Star Wars got the uh, putsu treatment. It got that beautiful uh, work from the artist on the cover, and they are just wonderful. So you know, I think it's important to remember as well that back in the Back in the late 70s in the UK, with our three TV channels and our strikes and our industrial disputes, it was a very dark time. So when you look at some of these images, you know, imagining those on the newsagent stand or landing on your doorstep, you can see the impact um, that they might have had. So the very first Star Wars cover was in December 1977, and it featured a Star Wars montage on the cover um of well <laughs> it's all there there's uh there's vader fighting ben there's han chewie leah luke stormtrooper r2 and uh and uh, 3po and a and a ralph mcquarrie looking x-wing and that was i i think the introduction to star wars to a lot of uk kids and and, and it was it's just stunning and what that issue gave us was a three-page spread with a competition to win soundtracks and t-shirts and it was just it's just a great kickoff. And Star Wars went on to feature a number of times. So the second one came in um, not long after in February, where you've got Mark Hamill as Luke on the cover next to Donna Summer. And the third cover was the the Letra set tie-in. So that's the one with, with the big Vader looming over with his sort of cat's eyeballs. Um, very distinct piece of work, that is. Star Wars breaks out in Look In this week. In every copy of Look In, there's an out-of-this-world free gift. Two rub-down color transfers from Star Wars. And there's a free competition for Star Wars models. Plus, an interview with Harrison Ford. And a color pin-up of Han Solo with Chewbacca. And Look In also has the latest adventures of the man from Atlantis, the Six Million Dollar Man, and the Bionic Woman. Plus a big pin-up of rich kids. So look out, Star Wars explodes in Look In this week. And And may may the the force be with you. you. So... These covers kind of went through from, like I say, 77 was the first one. Star Wars are featured on the television annual with ABBA and the Fonz, (laughs) a few of the people. Um, So it wasn't just the regular issues. It was also things like the annuals, which I think is a very uniquely British thing, where every year they would compile articles and puzzles into a hardback book that people would buy kids for Christmas. So that would happen in the winter and then in the summer you'd have a summer special. So you'd have a slightly bumper edition of a, of a paper magazine. So Star Wars appeared on all of those um, in its time. By the time we get to 
Empire in 1980. It's a cover by Arthur Ransom, who would later go on to work at uh, 2000 AD, and he worked on a lot of the strips inside the magazine. So it's sort of got that painterly style. And at first glance, you could be forgiven. It's another Putsuwa piece, but it's not. It's uh, it's by Arthur Ransom. So I've catalogued every occasion that Star Wars appeared on the cover of Looking, and you can scroll through. And you can see the covers and how they're related to features inside. So, for instance, sometimes it's quite tenuous. Uh, 30th of May, 1981, Chewbacca appears on a montage of monsters. You've got Frankenstein, is it Sweetums from the Muppets and Vincent Price. So clearly Star Wars on a cover helped sell a magazine. So it was shoehorned in quite a bit. It took a different tone in 82 so they dropped the um the painted covers in september 1981 and things went photographic but there were still a number of star wars covers that that proceeded timed to things like the uk debut of star wars being shown in 1982 and then of course by the time jedi comes around it's a full photographic cover so i think that's probably a good overview of um, the covers. Each one is nothing short of a work of art. I, I've always loved his work. This all sort of highlights just how uh, we've we've said it before, and you know, I'm sure we'll say it many times in the future. But back then, when we had painted film posters and real artists presenting the craft, and things as, as throw away as children's magazines, where you know, real work went into the covers. Whereas nowadays it's, it's just so easy, it's sort of Photoshop just takes away any kind of magic, I guess, um, any character, it's a sad state of affairs. But, you know, at least we, we, we have those to uh, remember. Yeah, and what's been really interesting about doing this is just the contextual stuff that it gives you, that collecting Marvel Star Wars weeklies or the poster mags don't give you because they're purely Star Wars. This is this is Star Wars in the context of what else was going on in a kid's life um, at that time. So you do get a cover with Darth Vader and Morka Mindy on it. You do get Han Solo and Chewbacca full colour pinups next to a Benny Hill cartoon strip. <laughs> and it's just, I think they're unique documents in that respect. And it does make for some really interesting juxtapositions. Uh, the latest cover I, uh, I found in terms of time dates back to 1989. And it's, uh, I think by this point, it, looking was on its third iteration in terms of its uh, its design styles. So it's very, very late 80s. Um, but you've got Star Wars on the cover sharing um, space with Michaela Strachan, Colin Jackson and Count Ducula. And it was a bit of a head scratcher, really, as to why it was there, because it seemed very late on for me. But the reason it was there was because it was timed with the showing of From Star Wars to Jedi, the making of the saga. You know, an excuse to trot Star Wars out again and put it on the cover. So there's a whole load of stuff about covers on there. You can go and check that out. Part two of the blog is where Lookin was giving kids of the time full colour pinups. So if you wanted a nice colour star wars poster for your wall in the 70s you had a few options you could go and get yourself the official star wars poster monthly you could go and buy yourself a scan decor retail poster um if you didn't win a goldfish you might have won a, a bootleg hildebrandt from the local fairground and obviously there were things like the palatoy coloring poster so there were a few options if you wanted to stick some star wars on your wall but one of the best ones was magazines like this and looking obviously realized that so they put together uh, a series of, of pin-up. Um, so there was, these were full page uh, images of, of the actors in their costumes or scenes from the movie. And they ran in a sequence over um, 1978. So there were eight in total. You had C-3PO and R2, you had one of Luke, you had one of Chewie, Leah, Han. Leah again, but in a medal ceremony outfit one of Han and Chewie and one of Vader and you see these crop up in uh, scrapbooks a lot and there's a great photo that um, a friend of the show Phil Heeks has let us put on the blog which is him in his bedroom um, and he's got a couple of these posters from the uh, the poster monthly 
and I think it's like a Factors Hildebrand poster, but he's got all of the, uh, well, for the most part, all of the looking pinups on his wall. And it's just brilliant. It's just that, um, that, that moment in time. That's what we did, you know, before the internet. And I don't know if anyone saw one of the unboxings I did sort of a few months ago with the vintage um, scrapbooks. But if you go and check out our uh, unbox section on the site, there's a there's an unboxing of Letters at Vintage Scrapbooks. And looking through that again after doing a lot of this research, it's kind of 70 percent looking content in there. Um, so it just goes to show that this stuff was valuable to us. It's stuff we kept. These full page glossy images were important. So they ran a set of eight in. 1978 but they also came around again in the early 80s and did a little, little run of what they call collector page so these were slightly more formalized so you know by the time the 80s rolled around looking had a lot more competition in things like smash hits so smash hits was a was a music magazine slightly irreverent very very design led wonderful stuff and looking had to sort of keep pace with that so they created this what they call collector page which is a a combination of a pinup with a little kind of questionnaire style um, interview down the side with um, with each individual so you could collect you know adam and all his ants or books fizz and in 82 they did a, a set of star wars collector pages and the reason that they timed that for 82 it's because that's when the double bill was doing the rounds in the country. So again, seeing that opportunity to get some Star Wars in the magazine. Um, but it's a, it's a lovely little set. So there were six of these and they were a mix of obviously 82. There's a mix of Star Wars and Empire imagery. But again, very of their time. You look at the design of these, the colour of them, the use of shapes. It's very, very <laughs> early 80s looking, a great document. So two sets of pinups. So if you have an eye to go in and collecting at runs of these, they're good places to start. They're the most visual elements of the magazine. The plan for the rest of the blog is to tackle all the other mentions. So I know there were features when Jedi came out. They took a chunk of the novelization and printed that in there. There's some behind the scenes special effects stuff around the Empire era. Um, so the, there were features that was specific to Star Wars. There's also a hell of a lot of stuff where it's kind of like, let's do a sci-fi roundup and there'll be Star Wars included in there as, as, a, as part of a more of a genre thing. Um, but then there's lots of smaller mentions and smaller kind of news articles where they're featuring models of R2-D2 that kids have made or there was a real sort of drive to feature kids collections kids would photograph their vintage Star Wars collection not their vintage at the time it was just their Star Wars collections um, and send them in and occasionally you'd get one of those cropping up in the magazine and they're really nice to capture so I've uh, I'm working on that um, there is one where they do a roundup of those there's a full page of kids all stood in their gardens on their patios with trestle tables and all their little loose figures and, and ships and play sets which is which is just wonderful so all that kind of stuff is to come. I've got a stack um, that I'm working my way through, photographing and uh, and logging and doing little write-ups for. And then part four will be all the ads that I mentioned. So certainly the Helix ads that feature the range, they're in a number of times. But I think, you know, if I get it in the right order and I find every issue, there's a there's a pretty comprehensive set of Palatoy ads in, in these magazines as well. So once that's done it will all go on the blog and then at the end what i hope to do is have the ultimate star wars looking database so you can go through chronologically and um issue by issue see what content there was for, for star wars in looking so it's a long job and uh you know i'm probably halfway through it but it's uh it's as good a time to mention it as any um and people can go and uh, and see where i've got to Dude, it's a great blog, which is full of nostalgia for me. Love the fact that it's just 20p. That reminds me, 20p and a 5p mix-up. That was my uh, pocket money. And uh, just goes to show with inflation, actually, my parents were complete tight asses because 20p was not much even back then. I think it's like equates to about 78p now or something like that. But um, the numbering is cool on these. I hadn't realised until you had articulated it in your blog because... 
you know, I came on the scene from a collecting point of view in about 82. So after they had changed more to the, the sort of colour photos. But the earlier one, 1982, is number 43 with Han, Luke and Leah um, cutscene from A New Hope. So, that yeah, that was number 43. And then you go to the following year and the uh, the Return of the Jedi one is number 23. So they're, they're not in sequential order, are they? They're in sequential order via that that year. Yeah. So they'd, they'd, they'd call them volumes. It would revert to number one every 1st of January, depending on where that fell, because it was they'd also list the week ending. And then there are some issues that we never produce because of strikes or right. other things that were going on. So it's, it is a very spotty, <laughs> a spotty kind of history. Um, well, damn you, Spivey, because you've now got me looking at eBay all over again now for something new because I've seen these and I'm like, yes, definitely. <laughs> and as well as the nostalgia for Star Wars, you're absolutely right because you can look at that and go, oh, yeah, there's an article on chips or there's an article on this and the full guy. Because uh, who doesn't know all the words to the Fall Guy song? Uh, so, yeah, great blog. Uh, I encourage everyone to go and uh, check it out. And uh, thanks, mate. Love it. I think for me, that's that's the really interesting thing, because we've previously discussed this with things like the you know, the Argus catalogue or the Sears catalogue, or um, if you look at the TV Times when Star Wars premieres, and you've also got that extra content of what was in the Z-Geist at the time, where Star Wars was in pop culture. I think that's, that's really interesting. But... Um, a question, Craig, is so if I was about to start collecting uh, looking magazines, much like Jez appears to be doing right now, what what kind of prices am I looking at? Is there any rarities or anything like that? Or or do these kind of things sort of slip through the net? I saw a couple of the ones with the Star Wars covers on eBay this week for like £79, which is just ridiculous. Um, but I think you know, that that's all part of that early Star Wars. People think it's worth more money than, than it perhaps is. I mean, these are produced in there. I mean, there are thousands, there's, uh, there, there's plenty around. I, I think there's some interesting things I've noticed. The, 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 the lookings with the Star Wars covers come up a lot and they can vary. So these things vary a lot on condition. Invariably, they've got someone's name or address scribbled on the front. That doesn't bother me, but it bothers some people. Um, so I think there are things that you need to look out for, like if it's a cover issue, whether it's got the inside, because sometimes it doesn't. So I think for like a cover issue you probably look in 10 15 quid more if it's super super quality people are quite savvy sellers are quite savvy so if it's got some star wars content that they tend to list it so if it's one of the pinups they tend to um go you know star wars mark hamill pinup on page whatever and sometimes you're looking at a bit of a premium on those i mean i've been paying between four pound fifty i think the most expensive one i've bought is around 15 quid but it's not the ones you would expect. You'd expect the ones with the covers to be the most expensive, and they're not always. So some of the um, the 80s ones I've really struggled to find. They've just been a long time on my on my watch list waiting for them to, to come up. I think what this is going to do, hopefully, by the end, is is allow people to look for specific issues because there's not a lot of that information out there. I mean, I've managed to piece together little bits. Um, there's a brilliant blog, which I've put in the um, links at the bottom, uh, John's lookout and the lookout checklist and what you can do is you can go on there and you can download high resolution scans of every issue but you have to <laughs> find the issue go through one by one download it takes a while it's high res flick through no there's no Star Wars in it so hopefully I'm saving people um, that job but yeah on the whole you don't want to be paying any more than 20 quid max for, for something that's super super duper because you know I think we've seen a spike recently in marvel star wars comics and maybe the odd starburst as well but um one thing i have noticed online is the uh, sale of paddy toy one page adverts or half page adverts from the comics so yeah. i wonder if there's anything that's paddy toy that's unique to look in that probably wasn't in a marvel comic so i haven't got to that bit yet but they're slightly bigger format than the marvels so they're slightly better bang for your book I think one thing I would say is it's quite thin paper. So they do suffer with condition. There's one particular Palatoy ad on the back cover of an issue from the 80s. And I have yet to find a clean one because it's a white it's a white ad on a back cover. Um, and you do get things like foxing and they do suffer a bit. The, the sort of paper stock does suffer. But I think the, when we get to the ads, and I know that we're going to discuss Palatoy ads in a moment, overlaying what we know about Palatoy ads with um, with 
with this user looking. I think that's going to could be quite valuable for people to have that information because it's it's certainly not out there in any digestible format at the minute. So you need to get in front of that information before those prices spike, mate. Yeah, I'm already, already <laughs> all over eBay and uh, checking completed listings. And uh, yeah, Craig's pretty on it actually. <laughs> Damn you, spike me. Thank you. Does you had a look in? Does the rest of you guys have looking when we when you were a kid? Absolutely. It was uh, well, I, don't, I never used to get it regularly, but friends used to get it. We used to sit there all together and, and, and go through it page by page back in the seventies. <laughs> Bloody hell! <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I know what you're into, and we're into similar things, Mark. I mean, you get issues where you'd get a Battlestar Galactic strip in there. There'd be Star Wars pin up in there. There'd be some Book Rogers. I mean, it was. <laughs> It was uh, it was essential, really. It, it really was, and especially when um, uh, going to the cinema back then was such a big deal. Not like it is now, where oh, let's go to the cinema. Back then, it was like a, a day out. Well, it was for, for us anyway. It was a real massive treat. And um, television, things like Looking, basically bought things that were like Star Wars onto the TV and made you aware of it. Like you said, there's no internet back then. It was very word of mouth. That's how things sort of travelled. You know, you didn't always know what was coming a month, two months down the line. Magazines like Looking were essential to know that these programmes were about to come onto the TV. You know, we were starved of stuff like this back then. So any outlet that uh, was... Um, able to give us an insight into you know new things coming on the television was absolute gold yeah there can't be many uh publications out there that, that have got big daddy the wrestler and uh a comic strip of mind your language so oh, <laughs> mixed oh, in with sh- glossy hollywood productions shocking shocking stuff <laughs> I mean, you wonder how some of it was translated into kids' cartoon strips, because these were quite adult, bawdy, seaside postcard humour of its time. And, you know, you look at some of it now and think, Jesus, how did that get get printed in there? But, yeah, that's looking. Yeah, well, a great, brilliant, brilliant topic, mate, and a brilliant uh, blog post. Do go and check that out. Yeah, looking forward to part two, Craig, and part three, part four, part five. (laughs) There's plenty to keep going at. Look in every week for explosive action with the Bionic Woman and the Six Billion Dollar Man. Look in every week for a load of fun with Benny Hill, Doctor on the Go, and Flintlock. Look in every week for On the Ball, the best in pop, super color pinups, and great competitions. Look in in every week. You'll love it.